It was here, in the great hall of the Cooper Union in New York City, that Abraham Lincoln spoke to a divided nation. Concepts of unity, compassion, and commitment to a set of ideas greater than ourselves have often echoed in this hallowed place. On this stage a hundred years ago, Volunteers of America was born. In 1896, hundreds of people filled this room to hear a young couple announce the formation of a new social movement. They were Ballington and Maud Booth. The motto of the organization would be to reach and uplift all people, helping those in need while enabling others to experience the joy of service. Today, the Booth's dream lives on. Volunteers of America has become one of the world's most vibrant and diverse charities. And on this, their 100th anniversary, they offer a unique perspective on how the nonprofit world has evolved. The first place we go is just outside this door to the streets of New York City. Volunteers of America was founded in New York City in 1896. The largest number of services that we offer today are to persons who are homeless, and that was true in the time of our founders as well. I'm a team leader of an outreach team with uh, Volunteers of America that uh, cruises the uh, streets and parks of New York City and engages uh, homeless people. These are the people that, just, you know, just like you and I, uh, they have had homes, something has happened, some kind of a trauma, psychological or financial, uh, drugs. But you know, they're as human as we are, and they have a soul as we are, and convictions and philosophies. And uh, we're trying to tap into that. And if we are successful in tapping into that, you know, we're building a relationship which eventually may lead to uh, some intervention. The purpose of the outreach program is to build a relationship with the person who's on the streets, who really does need to come in and get services, but who may not realize that. And it takes a very patient, very persistent approach to break through and make contact, bring that person in, and provide whatever treatment and help they need. How you doing? All right, so? How's life? It's rough. It's rough. My name is Alex Kutkovich, and uh, we're from Street Outreach. We volunteer. We have America. more people in our care than any other organization besides the so city of New York, and we've learned a lot from that experience. One of the things we've learned is that there are underlying causes of homelessness, and over time those causes have changed. How long have you been using drugs, guys? We're using the drug to suppress a lot of feelings that we should deal with. You know, from 12 years old, I was in the street. Wow. I stayed from aunt to aunt, you know, and then my sister died. Then I went to this, this rage that had a, a, a vendetta against everybody that wanted to care. You see, you go way back from childhood. I've been raped by my brother, my oldest brother, my cousin, my oldest cousin. My mother knew this, but she never did nothing about it. He's the first one that I told. And now I felt comfortable that I let the attention out. You know, my life, you know, basically it's the same thing. You know, I um, got molested by my uncle when I was young, when I was about eight, nine years old, and it continued, you know, and basically what happened was I took to the street life. One of the stereotypes about homeless people who are stuck in this shelter system or stuck on the streets is that they really could do something about this on their own. What has been happening is that we have been trying every day, you know, and my basic thing now is to, to obtain some type of 
you know, security in my life right now, you know, and in her life, so that we can build a foundation for the both of us. If the general public understood that we're dealing with problems of mental illness, problems of substance abuse. If we stay out here and constantly use the drugs, we're going to destroy one another, all right? And we're dying slowly as we use the drugs anyway. And that's where the Volunteers of America Outreach Team comes in. That's where the shelter system comes in. What I want you to do is uh, look over this. These uh, programs give you least, the least amount of red tape. The uh, Charles Gay Shelter on Wards Island is the largest complex to serve homeless people in the United States. And we currently are serving 912 men at that location. The complex is, um, consists of three buildings on eight acres of property. The building that we're going into right now it was the first building in the country that was built specifically to be a shelter. The outreach teams are based at Charles Gay and when they bring folks in who've been on the streets we're able to do an evaluation and we can keep them at that location and provide them with case management and treatment and work rehabilitation and eventually move them on to permanent housing. We're the only shelter in New York City that is handicapped accessible, so you're going to see many men in wheelchairs or who are otherwise mobility impaired. How you doing, guys? Good. How you doing, Dietrich? This is our cafeteria. We prepare 919 meals three times a day. Handicapped clients, staff will assist them by filling their tray for them if they need help with maneuvering their trays. We prepare an average of 800 to 900 bag lunches a day. They don't all stay here. We have an outreach team to find people on the outside who are homeless and we'll bring them here. Um, bag lunches consist of fruits, juices, nuts, and a sandwich. Uh, many of the people working behind the counter are men that are currently clients. The men on the line are part of the PBT program, which is Project Breakthrough. It's a job training, job experience program. And many of our staff members are former clients. People say that homeless people are, are just people that are out in the street. They're bums. They're, they don't really want to do anything with their lives. But when I did find myself on the street, it wasn't really that easy. Um, you're always looking over your shoulder. You don't know who's going to rob you, who's going to try to set you on fire, or who's going to try to do anything to you. Project Breakthrough Program, there's two different phases. It's a work experience program, phase one, and a job training, job readiness program, phase two. I had no place to go at the time. Um, I was clean. The problem was is that um, I just didn't have any employment at the time. I had uh, resumes all over the place, matter of fact over 100 resumes out, and still nothing. You could have a BA and an MA and it's like, psh, people think, well, okay, you're not supposed to be in the street, you're not supposed to be homeless. But I know lawyers, I know judges, okay, who are homeless, all right? And because of the fact is one thing or another happened to them and they lost their jobs. And either they lost a loved one and they just couldn't take the pressure, okay, or they couldn't take the pressure on the job in itself anymore. Whatever the case might be, anyone can become homeless. Most people today are living paycheck by paycheck. Now the men come in here and they receive training out of how to um, food safety training, how to prepare salads, how to serve meals. Um, we even teach them basic nutrition. I had heard about the program that they had here where you start working as a volunteer. People look at homeless as the homeless on the street and often feel that nothing is being done because they continue to see people living on the streets. What people don't see is, the, is our success stories. They said my work was very impressive. I was totally shocked, though, that I got staff when I did. They don't see the people that, that we've helped move off the streets, that we've helped provide service to and have been able to move on. I, I don't care what goes wrong in my life, no matter what. Even if I, I went out of job today or tomorrow, which I hope not, <laughs> God forbid, I still, I'm still going to keep fighting, no matter what, because I live better in the past and I can do it again in the future. And that's me, and that's a lot of other people here. Well, Volunteers of America Greater New York has programs that are staffed by 1,200 employees but we also have 650 volunteers who work alongside our employees. Okay, so put on the Vaseline, make sure you cover everything really thick, okay? And I'll start cutting, um, cutting the strips for us. I got um, involved with the Volunteers of America art program about a year ago now. I've been working in advertising as an art director 
weeks and I was laid off from a job and I took advantage of that time to kind of explore other options for myself. And it really seemed to be a perfect opportunity for me to use my art background and also my desire to make a difference, you know, do something that was rewarding. I'm from Mongolia and then I'm making these three masks. I bring from my government our $20,000 scholarship. There's like student loan, study arts, and then the money finish. I can continue my art study. I lost my apartment. I went to in the street. I can find a job. And I live like two years around in the street in the painting buildings. One time in my life, I uh, just worked myself too hard, and uh, the drinking got over me. And then I ended up with a nervous breakdown, and I uh, ended up in the hospital. You know. I feel like such empty. I don't trust people, I don't want to talk to people, I run away from people, stay away from them. I was, I was sometimes frightened of just moving from one place to another, park or you know, into the neighborhood or streets or something. And then I stuck here. <laughs> I don't do no such a well. I was just 29 years old and started to be going 29 years old. I just didn't uh, have no place to go to. and. Uh, I felt like, uh, like unattached with, with civilization, you know, with life. But being in a shelter now, now I have time, I had had time to think about my life and uh, I feel much better off now. Now I know that I have something, you know, or some place to go to, you know. I don't feel like cast out no more. I hear happy with these people. Now I get friends. I feel a little bit like men, and I do my artwork. The thing that's so dramatic about um, making a mask, especially a life mask, is that you're face to face with yourself. You have an opportunity to work on a human form. It's um, very personal. It's human. And through this, you have an opportunity to experience transformation. I have a little boy. Sometimes my heart, I miss him too much. I never know see him. I have five pictures. It's a, my brain was so weak. Now it's I get a strong brain. I know crying too much. What I learned in being here is that people have value. It gives me something uh, within myself to believe in. I, I feel proud that I could have something to show of my time being here. This program is about finding that inner value and finding what, what they have to express and who they can be and be proud of themselves no matter what they've gone through, no matter what might happen in the future. That, that that essence, that core of who you are, is strong and wonderful and can be expressed through artwork. Volunteers of America works in 300 communities across the country. In every one of those places, the programs are different. The idea is not to take something that works in New York and superimpose it on Detroit or Dallas. The idea is to let local needs determine the program. In Shreveport, Louisiana, the need was a program to uplift poor children from the Ledbetter Heights section of the city. The reason, it seems to me, that life appears to many people to be deteriorating now is not uh, a physical question. 
it's a spiritual question. It does seem as though our culture uh, is losing the, its centers, the idea of God, uh, the idea of a purpose for life. Uh, when I was these kids' age, I was full of hope and promise. Uh, the world is your oyster. You can just only think in terms of possibilities, and things were much different at, at that young age. So many basic ideas that structured society uh, are either dying or uh, being ignored. And when you don't have a structure for society, uh, then you begin to fear. And uh, we are becoming a, a very fearful society because the structures are gone. Our preschool instructor related this to me one day, walking her three and four year old charges home after preschool class. And they walked by this gentleman, and I used the term very loosely, who pulled out a gun and started shooting in the air. And the most tragic aspect of that story is this. How are you? Our preschool teacher looked around to look after her young charges. They didn't flinch. They didn't cry out. They didn't scream. They didn't reach for each other. They didn't even reach for her. They just kept right on walking. Just another day in the neighborhood. You ready for graduation? Yeah, I see you got a gown back there. You got something on it. Look at you. Look at you. How are you? <laughs> Good morning. As I see Volunteers of America, their people, their directors, their officers, their volunteers, are extraordinarily able people. I've worked, um, I was a captain of um, one of uh, His Majesty's ships in my younger days, and later on, one of Her Majesty's ships. Um, and they were sharp people. Um, I was the president of a college, and I gathered um, a, a team that were extremely able. I was the pastor of a 5,000 member church and managed to gather. But when I became a member of, of uh, this team, I recognized that this was about as able a group of human beings as I'd ever worked with. Well, um, we had some difficulties uh, living in poverty, uh, living in an environment that had uh, quite a bit of violence in it during a, a, a major part of my childhood. We were deprived of a lot of things, uh, a lot of things that are endemic to poverty. Uh, it really made a big impact on me as far as, as my outlook on things. I became very, very negative, uh, very hostile, and very aggressive at a point in my life, and it almost destroyed me. And when I look at it now and reflect upon it as, a, as an adult, uh, I can look at the factors that went into why I behaved some of the ways that I did. I think that some of the things that had a real impact on me as a teen were when adults would write me off and just take a look at me and decide that I wasn't worth investing in because maybe they looked at me and saw a black kid or they looked at me and saw a poor kid or they looked at me and, and didn't reflect upon my possibilities. They just looked at me and wrote me off. In our Lighthouse Club, I see young people that were, are rather much in the same predicament that I was. They're needing direction, guidance, and they're needing somebody to reaffirm their sense of self, to help with their ability to dream, to think in terms of themselves under a different set of circumstances. Our one main goal is to break the cycle of welfare dependency. And we have programs that I term educational support programs, whether they be for three and four year olds in our preschool programs, or after school programs for teens and adolescents, or job training and placement programs for adults, and what we attempt to do through our programs is work on this, this off-mentioned concept of self-esteem. So what we attempt to do with the young people that come to us is let them know that they're the most important people in the program, that the Lighthouse belongs to them. I think if I go around being bitter about what I've experienced and about what some of the persons that I serve have experienced, I don't know what that would accomplish other than making other people better. I want people to, to understand that, that if we have a collective will, we can make some change. I think an organization like Volunteers of America is beautifully placed in our time. Not only does it derive its motivation from the, the best place to get it, namely 
the love of God, and, and is committed by its very nature, by its constitution, by its mission statement, to reaching and uplifting and serving people and communities in need. Instead of being directed from a distant place, each local officer is required to have initiative, to find out what the needs are in his or her community. So vision is inbuilt into the task. This is our lighthouse reading and math club, and all of our participants come in. They're tested for their basal levels in reading and mathematics. After their testing, they have individualized assignments that they have to work on to complete. We have tutoring stations so that they can go and receive the tutoring that they need. Then when they get to a certain point in their lesson plan, they know that they're supposed to go get tested. Once they're tested at our testing station and they show gains in their test scores, those gains, those points, uh, earn points for them. And what we attempt to do is give the youngsters opportunities to earn points when they show gains on their tests in mathematics and reading. And then the points are redeemable for incentives. And what we're attempting to do is show kids that you do earn when you learn. And it sort of plays on the, the uh, a short period of duration to get gratification. So you can earn the points and cash them in, or you can save the points and you can earn interest. Ballington Booth, uh, in the beginning, uh, would always insist that for the volunteer, there was not only uh, empowerment. They became better than they thought they could be. But they also, he insisted, got joy out of it. There was a joy in it. It wasn't just for the salary. It, they got joy. This morning we're going to attend our preschool graduation. This is a high point of our program year. We've got some of our wonderful parents and supporters with us. And to come and See these youngsters in their caps and gowns graduating is a wonderful experience. Good morning. I often tell individuals that I don't work for the Lighthouse. I work at Volunteers of America's Lighthouse. I work for the kids. You achieve your tallest stature when you bend to help another. That's when you stand tallest. That's when you're closest to God. When you reach someone who probably does not have what you've been blessed with. Well, this is one of the special days of the year for me. In fact, uh, as they came marching in there, I found my heart in my throat. It is uh, knowing where these kids are when they start preschool in September and where they are come May. When I think about Volunteers of America, this, the Lighthouse, embodies it all. We must not write people off. The people that wrote me off they didn't realize that one day I could help make the community just a little bit better. These children are our children. They are all our children. I don't care where you live. I don't think that anybody should be heartless enough to say, that's not my issue, that's not my problem, that's for the people that live in this neighborhood. The social challenges we face in this nation are not insurmountable, not here. Not in this country. Nothing is insurmountable in the United States of America if we have a collective will and a renaissance of the American spirit. This is our country. We all live here. We have an obligation to make it better for the youth. And so that's my dream, that we'll have a society that is better for young people. to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all.
In New York, the magnitude of the problems confronting the homeless requires strong, sophisticated programs with an emphasis on structure. But in the end, it all comes down to the caregiver, that one individual who reaches out to help another. These are America's greatest visionaries, the men and women who reach and uplift the soul of the nation. Next time, we bring you the ultimate symbol of structure. In St. Paul, Minnesota, we'll visit a jail, the first women's jail in America to be run by a nonprofit organization. And then on to Denver to take you from an old-style street mission to a modern Meals on Wheels program. If you would like to order the companion book to the Visionary series, or would like to learn more about any of the Visionaries profiled, call 1-800-647-5559.